Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Bryce. In the October 2024 General Conference, in a very powerful, moving moment, President Nelson stood before all of us in his aging years and said, I urge you, I plead with you to begin now to prepare for the second coming of Christ. And then towards the end of his talk, he gave us this inspired counsel. He said, I urge you, to devote time each week for the rest of your life to increase your understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now that's a fascinating connection, that preparation for the second coming would involve coming to understand the atonement. And I would suggest that's because we are going to need to access that power, the power of his atoning sacrifice. We need to understand it so that we know how to claim its blessings and access its power. Otherwise, how could we survive in the events that are going to come? As Satan digs in his heels, knowing that he's going to be bound during the millennium, I testify that we are going to have to do what we did in pre-mortal life, that he's going to fight tooth and nail as he knows his days are limited. But what it's going to take from us is what we did in premortal life. The book of Revelation, the inspired version, says this is what it took to overcome him in premortal life. For they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. It was by the blood of the Lamb and our testimonies that we conquered Lucifer in pre-mortal life. Now, could it be that what President Nelson is saying is that once again, it will require the blood of the Lamb and our testimonies to overcome Satan, to finally bind him, remove him. Now, if that's the case, then we need to understand that atonement to the point where we can access its power. And I believe that's what President Nelson is inviting us to do, is study it to the point where you can tap into its power the power of his atoning sacrifice. So I am all in. I am 100% committed to spending time each week for the rest of my life studying his atoning sacrifice, the greatest event that ever occurred. And I'd like to share it with you. In fact, I think we should all share what we discover. I have learned that I get more out of my study if I know I'm going to be presenting it to someone else. And so thank you for allowing me to do that. I hope it's of benefit to you. But I plan on sharing with you what I discover as I study his atoning sacrifice. As I draw upon everything that I've learned throughout my life and continue that study for the rest of my life, I'd like to share some of the things that I find. I know that will benefit me and I hope it will benefit you. I would encourage you to share what you discover with people in your inner circle. I think that will all that will benefit us all. I'd love to hear what you discover as you study his atonement. Now, for those of you who are feeling a little overwhelmed, how do you go about studying the atonement of Christ for the rest of our lives? Where do you begin? What structure does that study look like? Is it just aimlessly reading verses or is there some structure that will help me see it more clearly? Allow me to suggest a structure, something that I received from prophets, seers, and revelators, that every time I've ever taught a class on the atonement or the Savior has really helped me compartmentalize my study of his atoning sacrifice. I hope this will help. Take it for what it's worth. The first suggestion comes from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, a beloved apostle who I dearly love. I have tried to read everything that he ever wrote because he was absolutely brilliant. In one of his books, Elder Maxwell said the following, It was Christ's character with his unique combination of celestial attributes which brought him to and got him through Gethsemane and Calvary. 
That is an astounding thought. Jesus could not have done what he did without being who he is. It is his character that made it possible. Only someone with those divine attributes and his character could have done what he did. I love this line from the hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away, that says, He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Only he, only someone with his divine attributes, his character, could have done it. It was his character that brought him to and got him through Gethsemane and Calvary. Now, I would suggest there's a starting point. That's where I'm going to begin. Who is he? What is it about his divine character, his celestial attributes that made his atoning sacrifice even a possibility? Who is he? Before we study what he did, I think we need to study who he is. Now, number two, in 1977, a very young elder Boyd K. Packer stood at the podium in general conference and gave what he said might very well be his most important general conference address. He said the following, I have not, to my knowledge in my ministry, said anything more important. I intend to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to what he adds right after that. About what he really did and why it matters now. And I would suggest those are the next two. Who he is. We start there. Who he is that brought him to and got him through Gethsemane and Calvary. And then what did he really do? I think most Christians know he did something significant. It involved his death and his suffering. And somehow it saves me. But I don't know they can go very further than that. I don't know that they can explain what he did that saves them. But we have the benefit of the restoration. We can answer those questions and fill in some of those lost details. What did he really do? Why did he need to suffer? Why does Heavenly Father need a suffering Savior in order to save us? What did he really do? And then number three is, why does it matter? How does it make a difference in my life? How do I claim the power of his atoning sacrifice? What do I need to do today on a daily basis to tap into that power? Who is he? What did he do? And why does it matter in my life today? How do I claim those blessings? I would suggest that that's a great structure to start with as you study his atoning sacrifice. That's the structure I'm going to follow. First, I'm going to look at who he is. What are his divine attributes? What is his divine and celestial character? And then what did he really do? And finally, we'll ask, how do I take advantage of it? How do I access the power? What do I do to tap into that power on a daily basis? Now, before we jump into that, going back to Elder Maxwell's comment that his character got him through his atoning sacrifice, I think it's important to understand where we fit in this. Not only are we beneficiaries of his atoning sacrifice, we are participants. And that creates a unique relationship between us and Savior. Saved and Savior have a very, very unique relationship. Let me see if I can show you a couple scriptures that seem to connect atonement to the closest thing here on earth that we mortals experience. I think Jesus desperately wants us to understand what he did and why it matters. And so he compares it repeatedly in the scriptures to, I think, the closest thing on earth. His atonement is frequently compared to a woman giving birth to a child. Now, I hope you can initially begin to see some connections. How is Jesus giving birth to our salvation? 
through labor and pain and agony like a woman bringing life into this world and giving birth to a child through labor and pain and agony. Let me show you a handful of scriptures that make that connection. How is the atonement like childbirth? First of all, this one in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49, to the question that we often say, notice that Israel quite often said it, and sometimes we find ourselves saying the same thing. We often say in verse 14, the Lord hath forsaken me, my Lord hath forgotten me. Now the Savior steps in and says, I can't possibly forget you. It is not possible to forget you. Let me tell you why. And then he connects atonement to childbirth. He says, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? That's an interesting comparison. I have watched my beloved wife give birth 10 times. And I know the price she has paid for each one of those children. It is a tremendous price. And because of that price, she can't walk away. I've seen it so many times. Women who have just given birth cannot walk away. I've paid too high a price. This is a horrible analogy, but just maybe for a sake of comparison, have you ever paid a lot of money for a really bad meal? You don't like it at all, but you spend a lot of money on it. You just can't throw it away, right? I've paid too much money to throw it away. So you end up eating it, even though you have no desire to do so, because of the price you've paid. And I think that describes what women go through when they give birth. They've paid so high a price to bring that child in. Now, does the baby give mom occasionally some reasons to walk away crying through the night? Of course the baby does, but she can't walk away. She has paid too high a price for that child. She's in, she's all committed. Now, Jesus is saying, I've done the same thing. I can't walk away. I've paid too high a price for you. But do you see the comparison? Atoning sacrifice of Christ, giving birth. I can't walk away because I've paid too high a price. Now, let me give you a second one. As the Lord is explaining to Enoch the whole plan of salvation, he makes that comparison of a woman giving birth and Jesus bringing salvation. He says in Moses chapter 6, that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death. And inasmuch as ye were born into the world, that's my mortal birth, that's my mom. I was born into the world by water. Whose water? Mom's water. And blood. Mom's blood. Mothers shed their blood to bring a child into the world. Do you see the connection? And the spirit. Now that was my spirit entering my body. So water, blood, and spirit. Inasmuch as you came into the world by water and blood and spirit, which I have made, and so became of dust a living soul, even so you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven of water. Now that's time it's baptismal water. But it's kind of a womb again. It's like the womb. I'm coming out. I'm fully encased in water and I come out of that water. So I have to be baptized. It's once again, enter into that womb and come out a new creature. And of spirit, Holy Ghost, and be cleansed by blood. Even the blood of mine only begotten. Jesus and mothers shed their blood to bring us life. Do you see the connection? Once again, it's his atonement and giving birth to a child. Let me just do one more from the Book of Mormon, how Jesus is very much our father because he gives birth to us. It's that whole image of giving birth. In King Benjamin's address in Mosiah chapter five, verse seven, King Benjamin says, 
And because of the covenant which you have made, that covenant where you enter a womb again, you enter the waters of baptism and you're covered by water again. Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. Once again, that's the comparison. Being born to Jesus through his atoning sacrifice, through the covenants we make with him, is like being born when your mother gave birth. So if that's kind of our relationship, if we have a mother-child relationship with the Savior through atonement, let me share a fascinating little thing I learned about the mother and the child relationship. I have an undergraduate degree in molecular biology. Now I've loved that, but it's not often that I get to use that degree in gospel teaching. But let me do so today. There is a concept called chimerism. Chimerism is when an organism has two distinct, or, uh, two or more, two or more distinct, distinct sets of DNA. Now the most common chimerism is maternal fetal microchimerism. It manifests itself when a woman is pregnant with a baby. What happens is the cells of that baby migrate into the mother's bloodstream and they, they flow through the mother. So the mother has cells from the baby inside her. And they have found those chimeristic cells decades later, long after she gave birth. There's an imprint of the baby physiologically at the cellular level inside the mom. She carries with her cells of each of those children. Now, what's fascinating is researchers have found those chimeristic cells in the mother's scar tissue. That means those cells, the cells of the baby found an injury and helped repair it. One of my favorite studies, one of my favorite stories that I studied was a woman who had an, a heart condition and she was pregnant. Later, after the pregnancy, they found the baby's cells in the tissues of her heart at the site where the condition manifested itself. The baby was healing the mom while the mom was growing the baby. That's our relationship when we're in our mother's womb. My, the baby's cells flow into the mother and make a permanent impression upon mom and actually help heal mom while mom is growing and healing the baby. That's the relationship they have with each other. Baby heals mom while mom is giving life to baby. That's a beautiful relationship. Now, if our relationship with Christ, as the scriptures suggest, is like that mother-child relationship, then I would suggest that same idea of chimerism exists with him, that each one of us, because of his atoning sacrifice, each one of us made a permanent impression upon him. And I would suggest in that dark moment when he was at his lowest, when he had been abandoned by the Father, it is my testimony that you healed him in that moment. That you are the reason, you are what got through him, you are what got him through his agony. Now he gets you through yours. That is the relationship we have with our Savior. Saved and Savior is a unique relationship. Let me see if I can show that to you in the scriptures. 
We could use both Isaiah or when King uh, or, uh, Abinadi quotes Isaiah to the wicked priests of Noah. So I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 53 that wonderful chapter about with his stripes we are healed. You can find this in the Book of Mormon. King or Abinadi, keep doing that. Abinadi is going to use this chapter with the priests of Noah. Let's start in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Absolutely beautiful description of the Savior and his his victory. But I want to jump to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The only way to save us was if he is bruised. It pleased Heavenly Father to bruise him in order to save us. But listen to what it says. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. I think there's two different ways we can look at the word when. Clearly, I think there's a reference to after. We know that after he suffered, he went into the spirit world and saw his seed, saw the believer. So I could read this, after thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. But I believe with all my soul, and the spirit has testified to me that an alternate reading is that that word when means while, while. Let me read it differently, and you'd see if you can see that chimeristic connection we have with Christ. While thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It is my testimony to you that in his darkness, when his father abandoned him so that the victory could be his, in that darkness, when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that darkness, he saw your life. He saw each of us individually, not as a group, but I testify he is a one by one God. And just like he did in third Nephi, one by one, he saw each one of us. He saw what his sacrifice would do in our behalf. He saw the healing that it would bring. He saw us while he was suffering. And that's what got him through the darkness. That's why he was able to finish when his father abandoned him. He saw us. He saw you. You healed him while he was performing the very act to heal you. That is the relationship we have with him. So everything we study, we need to understand we are tied and connected to him in a way that cannot be separated. So back to Isaiah when he says, can a woman forget her sucking child? They may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Now notice what he says right after that. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. We have healed him. We have made a difference in his life. We have made an impression upon him. Like that baby makes an impression upon the mother. We have connected with him in his moment. We healed him when he was in darkness. And now he heals us in our darkness. When we study the atonement of Christ, we need to understand that we are massive recipients of that blessing. But in one small degree, we are participants. We were with him. We were there getting him through it. 
And now he is here getting us through it. Of that relationship, that sacred relationship between you and your Savior, saved and Savior, I testify you are eternally connected to him. Let's study that connection as well as his victory. Let's understand who he is, what he did, and why it makes a difference in our lives. May you know that I stand as his witness. I know he lives. I know that he is light and life and love and law. That he is the great I am. That he is our savior and redeemer. And that we can and actually will be saved because we have a Savior. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.